Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you here in the room tonight and also to those people watching online to the fourth talk of this year's Cambridge Climate Lecture Series. If you are watching online, please send in any questions during the lecture for the question and answer session at the end of the talk by either tweeting with the hashtag CCLS2019 or on the Facebook's video comment section. The lecture series was set up two years ago in memory of Sir David Mackay in order to raise public engagement on the topic of climate change and to, to facilitate some of the difficult conversations that come with this. this, the, this the theme of this year's series is climate change. Can we fix it? Conversation around climate change has moved past the point of debating whether it exists now, but instead we're starting to wonder whether the, there is really anything viable that can be done to reverse or halt the trends that we're seeing. For this, the fourth of the CCLS series for 2019, we have the pleasure of welcoming Ro Randall, who is a psychoanalytically trained psycho psychotherapist, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Researching, writing, and blogging on climate change. She lives in Cambridge and is part of the Climate Psychology Alliance. Ro asks how we can deal with the strong feelings climate change evokes. The experience of speaking out about this most urgent of issues is fraught with conflict. How can we cope with the anger, avoidance or, uh, sorry, avoidance or disobedience that erupts into relationships when the subject is introduced? Ro will offer us some insights which will help us all with our conversations on climate change. Yesterday, Ro ran a workshop with A-level students and we will no doubt hear more about this tonight. After the talk, there will be a question and answer session where Ro will be joined by Dr. Hugh Hunt, who is a reader in engineering and who is chair of CCLS. He works on the controversial subject of geoengineering. How can we refreeze the Arctic? But first, without any further ado, please welcome us in, join it, welcome us in joining Ro Randall to talk about climate change, psychology and conversation. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming here tonight. I'm very pleased to have been asked to come and give this lecture in the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series. And um, the doesn't seem to be anything up on the screen at the moment. <laughs> Is the had a small technical hitch? I can do this without pictures, <laughs> but it'll come. It'll it'll come back in a minute. Um, you probably saw that the title of my talk and then the introduction was about how we, how we talk about climate change. And I referred there to the unconscious dynamics of how we talk about climate change. And this comes from the fact that as a psychotherapist, what interests me most is always what lies beneath the surface, what's hidden, what we conceal from ourselves, what we'd rather not think about, the things which maybe we feel ashamed of or upset about, and which we repress or push down, get out of sight. And these feelings which we banish can often have huge effects on our lives and on our relationships. Oh, great, we're back. OK. Um, and have, can have really quite a, big, quite a big impact. And climate change is a topic which consists of very unwelcome facts and which if people actually really allow it to enter their lives, enter their experience, produces strong emotions. Um, and as a result, people have numerous ways of avoiding this subject. And many of the defences and difficulties which I deal with in the consulting room as a psychotherapist are also present when climate change arrives as a subject in conversation. And I hope that what I've got to say tonight may prove helpful to you as you struggle to talk with others about this important and urgent subject. Um, it's also quite unusual for me to be doing the talking. As a psychotherapist, what you do is you listen to other people. <laughs> so <laughs> what I thought I would do to start with was actually to try to find out just a little bit about you all. Um, and <laughs> but since I can't sit you all down in front of me one by one and make my usual beginning, um, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in response to some questions. Um, and I think it would be interesting for all of us to see a little bit about who's here and what our experiences are. So first of all, could you raise your hand if you're studying or researching climate change or uh, teaching it or 
working on a related subject such as sustainability or have a job working in that field. Okay, so raise your hand. That's, I would say, somewhere between a third and a half of those present are actually people who know a lot about climate change. Could you, all of you, raise your hand if you've talked about climate change in the last week to a family member? A family member. Whoa, that's a good number. Great. And could you raise your hand if you've talked about climate change in the last week to a stranger? Again, quite a few of you. That's very interesting. And if you've just talked to anybody outside your work-related field about climate change. Yep. Most people here are talking about climate change. And I know that if I had asked you an audience this question a year ago, far fewer people would have, been, would have raised their hands in response to that question. But I think what we've seen in the last year is a bit of a shift in how much climate change enters um, public discourse. But two final questions. Could you raise your hand if some or any of those conversations have been enjoyable? <laughs> right, OK, so that's actually quite a big difference. Those of you at the front probably can't see, but there were not many hands went up there. And so finally, raise your hand if some or any of those conversations have been difficult. Right, that's the majority of those conversations have actually been quite hard. And that doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. So what this shows, I think, is that although people are talking about climate change more, they're finding it really, really quite tough. And this, this slide is just... It's a list, really. It's two lists, in fact, of what people feel when they actually really allow themselves to think properly, deeply, about climate change, when they allow it to come into their, their lives. These are very negative feelings on the whole, and they're really upsetting feelings. Shock, disbelief, fear, guilt, anger, powerlessness, despair, and so on. And some of them are much slower burning issues, which stay with you, the anxiety, the grief, the depression. Because this is a subject which challenges people's sense of identity, their ideas of the future, the basis on which society is organised, and our continued existence as a species. And the feelings which I've put up here were, some of them were described to me anecdotally, but they're also, also they come from some interviews in a research project which I conducted with Paul Hoggett from the University of West of England, which was published in Envi the journal Environmental Values last year. And I'm going to talk very briefly about a part of that research um, because I think some of the experiences that emerged in that have quite a lot to tell us about the very difficult journey which people need to go on if they're actually going to really allow climate change to become a subject that influences them and influences what they do. So, um, I've talked here about the, the activist's trajectory. And this was a piece of work which interviewed in depth a small sample of climate scientists and of climate activists as people who really had had to allow climate change to enter their experience very deeply. And it's the activists I want to focus on because it's their journey which I think many of us maybe haven't gone on and need to go on in the population at large. And what they described was, first of all, there was a moment of epiphany when suddenly it was as if they woke up. There was this massive subject that was life-changing they needed to do something about. This was followed by a period of immersion. And this was immersion in two things. It was immersion in the facts, but it was also an immersion in these very difficult emotions, which um, I indicated in the previous slide, those ones. And one of the things which made a big difference to them in this was that they were all part of very closely knit groups of support which I think made it possible to deal with some of these very, very difficult feelings. That phase of immersion was then followed by movement into action, and the action which characterised um, these people's lives was civil disobedience in one form or another. And 
followed by, often for a lot of them, crisis and resolution because the level of activity was such that it wasn't, in the long term, sustainable. But they moved to a point where civil disobedience, for the most part, didn't um, vanish from their lives, but it took perhaps a slightly more balanced place. One of the other things about these people was that for all of them, they all came to lead very, very low-impact lives. And the reason for this wasn't that they thought that this was the most important thing to do about climate change, not at all, but it was simply that it felt morally impossible to live any other kind of life once you had really acknowledged what climate change was and what it was going to do. And so I think this is a good model for a journey that most people resist. And I'm going to talk very briefly about the process, the psychological process, that means that most people don't even get to the epiphany. And this is a problem, this is a, this is a process which psychoanalysis calls disavow. And this is a form of defence where people accept the, the facts of climate change, and you can see that people know the facts of climate change from public surveys. Are you concerned about climate change? Most of the population say yes. But that fact of climate change and what it is is separated. It's split off from what it means. It's split off from the emotional significance, and it's split off from any sense of personal involvement or responsibility. And this is why you can have a conversation which will sake absolutely seamlessly from somebody remarking, oh, it's very hot, it's probably climate change, to chatting about the flights that they're just booking without feeling that those two things are actually connected. One of the important things to understand about this psychological process of splitting is that when the mind splits, it becomes much less capable of reflective thought. Everything appears in polar opposites, black and white, right and wrong, yes or no. And this often lies behind some of the difficulties which we encounter when we come, when we come to try to talk with people who haven't really begun this journey, which in reality, of course, people are going to make in all kinds of different ways. You're not necessarily all going to take part in civil disobedience, but in some way or another, you will find whatever it is for you that feels commensurate with the reality that we face. I thought I'd just tell you the little story about how I moved from this state of disavow to the point of epiphany. Um, and this is the story from about 15 years ago, and I was out on a walk um, with my husband and my son, who at that point was 21 years old. And he'd just started a new job, and he was, this is in Wales, and he was working for an environmental organisation. It's his first job out of university, and he's full of enthusiasm for what he's doing and um, telling me about his colleagues, about the project he's working on, the fact that everybody there calls him Fat Al because he's so skinny. And um, <laughs> into this conversation, he suddenly says, did you know, Mum, that the average UK carbon footprint is somewhere between 10 and 14 tonnes? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, and that the sustainable footprint and what we all need to be down to pretty fast is one and a half tonnes. And I say, I think you've probably got that wrong, Alex. And um, he says, no, Mum. No, it's absolutely right. And my husband starts doing calculations in his head because that's the way he protects himself, is with numbers. And <laughs> this conversation goes on. And it's one of those family conversations where there's a bit of conflict. Um, and I remember it's this Welsh misty day and the sun's just kind of breaking through and we're coming out of a wood. We come on to... Um, a tarmac road and I actually stamp my foot and I feel this vibrate up through my walking boots the way you do when you stamp your foot in your walking boots on a hard tarmac road and I say I don't believe you this can't be true because if it's true we'll never be able to come and see you again we won't be able to afford the petrol we won't be able to heat the house so I've really lost it by this point as you can see but Actually, this was the point at which something opened up for me because I realised that this connected with some values that were very important to me about justice and about equality. And reflecting on it later, this was the point at which I decided this was an issue that I needed to get involved in. I'd thought up to then that I was really quite well informed about environmental issues and climate change. But this was the moment when I realised that there was something more to it. 
So that was just a story about um, my, my moment. Um, I think if you've come to the lectures that we've heard so far in this series, you'll be very aware that we face a climate emergency. And I suspect that from your own conversations about climate change, you're also very aware that there's a lot of public silence about it. And I think that the um, problems that this face, faces us are quite serious. It's very difficult to speak about without... How do you do it without inducing terror or despair? Producing this defensiveness that I was speaking about, finding that you're being ignored or belittled, put down, falling out with friends or family or colleagues. You can see in my description of my own journey how very nearly I could have fallen out with my son. But I think one of the prerequisites for the times that we're living in now is being able to talk about climate change. There needs to be a big national conversation about this subject. We know what needs to be done, but we don't have the broad-based political movement that would persuade politicians to act. And that means we have to talk, that in order to create that movement, people need to talk. And I think there's an opportunity for that talking to take place at the moment. But we need to know how to talk effectively about climate change because experience shows that those feelings which I put up on the slide earlier lie just beneath the surface and they cause immense trouble when people do talk about climate change to those who are outside their small circle of agreement. And it leads to really a lot of distress. So what is involved in talking effectively about this extremely difficult subject? Well... Number one is something which is beloved of campaigners on any topic whatsoever. And we have to ditch it. This is known as the information deficit model. Um, I'm sure some of you have come across this. But this is the idea that what we think as campaigners is that those benighted folk out there just don't know the truth. And that if we tell them, they're all going to go, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I get it now. And they're going to fall in with what we want. But if you ever remember being a kid and your mum telling you, um, it's cold outside, you better put your coat on. And whether that information actually made you put your coat on or not, you'll probably remember that mostly you went outside in your T-shirt and you didn't actually pay any attention. You didn't want that bit of information at that point. Information is only useful when somebody is ready for it, when someone has got into a receptive state of mind. Um, but the other thing is that I think we need to focus more than we do on the process of a conversation. We also need to be able to speak personally and tell our own stories. But what I'm going to talk about next is this question of what is it that happens in a conversation when it's going right or when it's going wrong. And these are ideas which, um, these are ideas which come from psych psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, my profession. And I've kind of put them into some kind of, I've translated them because psychoanalysis talks in a kind of language of jargon. So when we talk about climate change, mostly what people think about is what have I got to say about it, the content. So this is the first level of, converse, of, of a conversation. And to me, this is just like the, this is the surface. This isn't, doesn't tell us very much about what's really going on. It's, you know, climate change, what's for supper, what time's the bus coming, did you hear what happened to me last week? It's content. My second level is the mood and the emotion. How are people feeling from moment to moment? You know, a conversation can be light-hearted, it can be serious, it may be very depressed. If you've talked about climate change, you've probably found it's quite awkward. And that people's emotions will shift from moment to moment through a conversation. You might start out a bit edgy. You might settle down to feeling more comfortable. You might be suspicious. You might feel rather loving towards somebody. You might be enthusiastic. There are all kinds of feelings which will arise in a conversation. And very often, when we're talking about something that's upsetting, we don't pay very much attention to those feelings. The third level that I want to talk about, I've called it gender. And this sounds a bit formal. What I mean by it is what you hope to get out of the conversation. Because every time you're involved in a, 
even in an informal chat with somebody, there's something that you're hoping for. You might just be wanting to pass the time of day. You might be wanting to connect with somebody else emotionally. Um, you might be wanting to flirt. You might be wanting to convert somebody, something which I'm afraid a lot of us concerned with climate change <laughs> try to do. So there's always something, even if it's just to kind of convey to the other person your goodwill. And finally, perception. How do people see each other? What are they assuming about each other? We all label people the moment they walk into the room. What kind of person do I think this is? And then the moment they speak, we try to slot them into some sort of category that we've already got. Parent, <coughs> child, idiot, idol. We may look up to them, we may look down on them, but in some way, we've got, we're, we're all the time, we're perceiving things which very often have very little to do with how that other person actually sees themselves. I'm going to give you another example, which is actually from my own life. Sorry, Andy. Um, a woman says to her husband, um, have you thought about supper? And the comment is a factual question. Content, sorry. The content is a factual question. But the woman's mood is rather edgy and irritable um, because she's attempting, and she's attempting to conceal this because she doesn't want to row. And her perception is that her partner is lazy and thoughtless because it's already late and he's checking his email again. So her agenda is to get him to make supper. <laughs> so what does he reply? Well, he says, not really, which is factual and true. That's the content. He has not been thinking about it. But his mood is irritable in return because he feels wrong-footed. And his perception of his wife is a parental one. It's mother telling him off. And so his agenda is just not to lose face. <laughs> so you can see in that eight word exchange, have you thought about supper? Not really, that there is an awful lot more going on. And this is true of just about any conversation that you, um, that you have. So what I would like all of you to do now is to return in your mind to the conversation, one of the conversations that you brought to mind earlier when I asked you, had you been talking to anybody about climate change? Or you can think about another one from earlier. But what I'd like you to do is to bring it back to mind. And I'm going to go through these categories with some questions which might help you focus on those different levels. And what I'd like you to do is to see if you can apply them to the conversation that you have as I, as I go through them. OK, so here are the, here we are. Um, so this first level of the content, what was the other person talking about? And what were you talking about? And were you talking about the same thing? You may not have been. So that's my first question. You then add in the mood and the emotion. What were you feeling? And were your feelings and those of the other person similar or different? And did your feelings change as the conversation went on? In many, many conversations about climate change, the feelings are shifting all the time. And did the mood of the conversation shift as it went on? You know, it may have started out really quite friendly, quite well-intentioned, and it may have ended up with both people feeling rather embarrassed and withdrawing and really not quite knowing where to look, for example. So what happened to the mood of, that com of this conversation? What happened to your feelings? What can you tell about the feelings of the other person? What are we trying to do? What are we hoping for? This is the agenda. What were you hoping this conversation was going to do? What was the other person trying to do? See, you may have been trying to talk about climate change. They may have been trying to get out of the room as quickly as possible. <laughs> uh, were your agendas compatible? 
And did they shift during the conversation? Obviously, what you're hoping for when you bring up climate change is that the agendas are going to shift. They're going to stop wanting to run for the hills and they're going to sit down and really engage with you. It doesn't always happen. And so finally, the perception. How did you see the other person? Did you start off feeling, God, that idiot, that's the sixth flight they've taken? Or were you thinking, oh, it's my mum. She's, she's my favourite person, for example. What did you imagine they were thinking of you? You may have felt put in a box by the other person. You may have felt that you were kind of getting very constrained, perhaps in um, this role of um, puritanical environmentalist is one that quite often may come your way. Um, but what do you think they imagined that you were thinking of them? Well, did they think that you were very critical of them? Were they right? Maybe not. Did anyone's perceptions change as the conversation went on? Did anyone come really to any better understanding of each other? Okay. So that's some detail about those conversations. And maybe we could just take another show of hands. Um, could you raise your hand if you manage to recognise any of those levels in the conversations about climate change that, that you were thinking about? Yay! It made some sense. I'm, I'm hoping that was more than recognising the content. I think it probably was. But I thought I'd tell you about two conversations which I had um, last summer, just to illustrate what, I'm, what I mean. When it was very, very hot, I decided that I was going to talk about climate change any time anybody mentioned the weather. <laughs> and so all of those times when, you went, when I went into a shop, a lot of these conversations took place in shops. Every time I went into a shop and somebody would say, oh, are you enjoying this hot spell? And the expected answer is, yes, yeah, isn't it lovely? I would say, oh, well, actually, it doesn't suit me very much. And um, it, it kind of, it, it bothers me. I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about it. And some people would instantly get it. Some people would go, oh, right, I see what you mean. And some people would say, oh, why? And I would explain a little bit more. I would say, well, I think this is just the start. We know that everything's going to get hotter and hotter. And I don't know about you, but my garden's completely dried up. And it makes me really worried about how we're going to cope if this kind of weather comes every summer and for longer. And then they go, oh, right, climate change. And that would usually be the end of the conversation. And we'd part in, on good terms. And what had happened in those, in those kinds of conversations was I'd pushed just a little bit at the boundary of the kind of, you know, shopping checkout conversation where you... <laughs> You know, the one that ends, uh, have a nice day. Um, and I think I probably stopped anybody saying have a nice day at that point. <laughs> but what I'd hoped was that I had just uh, introduced a little tiny bit of disturbance into their life and into the way of thinking by making climate change into something that people talked about at the supermarket checkout. So that maybe they went home and said, do you know what some woman said to me in the, <laughs> on the chill today? And that, would, that might spark another conversation. So I hadn't done very much, but I just pushed a little bit. But of course, not all of these conversations went well. And this is one that went badly. It started out exactly like the other one. I'm in the supermarket. There's a guy sitting um, on the checkout. He's maybe in his 50s. He looks a bit downcast. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe he's somebody who's, you know, this isn't a nice job he's doing, and maybe it's quite hard work. So I'm kind of quite smiley, I'm quite cheery. And we have the first little exchange about climate change. Yes, he acknowledges, he, yeah, he knows what it is. He, sees, he says, yes, yeah, see what you mean. And then he says, he says, but these climate scientists, he said, they tell us all about what's wrong, and then they jump on their planes and they go jetting off to their conferences. Hypocrites, hypocrites, a lot of them. And he suddenly agitated. And I can, if I paid attention, I would have heard in his voice the agitation, 
the irritation, the resentment, the sense of anger at this entitled elite who think they can tell other people what to do and jump in aeroplanes and go off on their holidays or their conferences. Probably thought they were pretty much the same thing. So what did I do? I said, oh, actually, by the way, I know, one of the, I know one, somebody who's a leader of one of these climate groups, and they're trying very, very hard to reduce the number of flights they take. And I start burbling on about climate scientists I know. And then I start burbling on about Skype calls and train fares and difficulties of getting together. And I am digging a deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper hole. And I've sort of shamed this man I've shamed myself we're both thoroughly embarrassed by this point because I have broken the rule of the shopping conversation I haven't pushed at it I've actually broken the rule and so I gather up my shopping and I leave as quickly as I can knowing that I have actually had absolutely no effect at all so that's just an example of how easily a conversation can go wrong. I came out with a piece of information and I placed myself firmly amongst an elite that this man had just told me he didn't think very much of. It wasn't very smart. So that's just to tell you how somebody like me with uh, all my experience makes a mess of it sometimes. So what should we do about this? I think that's the next question. So... Um, I'm going to suggest to you some tools that can help in these tricky conversations which come from, these are tools which come from my own experience as a psychotherapist, trying to find ways of applying these that other people can use. So we need to concentrate not on the content of what we want to say, but on the process. I sometimes say to people that there isn't really very much you need to know about climate change. You need to know that it's happening. You need to know it's dangerous. You need to know it's real. You need to know it's caused by us. You need to know we need to do something about it really, really quickly. Beyond that, maybe not a lot of facts. So what do you have to do if you want to talk about something which produces these really difficult emotions that I talked about earlier? Shock, fear, disbelief sense of powerlessness, sense of having your life kind of switched from one direction into another to take account of this. You need to create sufficient safety for that conversation to take place. Now, in those first supermarket conversations, I kept it quite safe. The second one, I didn't. And you can create safety in a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> One important thing is that you need to have dealt with your own distress. You need to have found somewhere to talk about your own distress. Because if you don't, it spills out all over the place. And what happens is that people actually become concerned for you. You'll find friends going, oh, don't get so upset about <coughs> it. It's all right. Instead of actually listening to what you've got to say. So there is a need to find your own peer group where actually you can talk with <coughs> other people in a supportive <coughs> setting about what this means for you, how it might change your life. One of the other things you need to do is you do need to tell the truth. Sometimes people say, well, shouldn't we give people a hopeful message and tell them it's all going to be fine? I don't think this helps. If you're facing a serious diagnosis, a serious medical diagnosis, on the whole, what the research tells us is people cope better when they have been told the truth in a supportive setting. I think climate change is very similar. We do need to tell the truth. Another thing that helps is speaking for yourself. You'll notice that in those two conversations, in the first ones, I said what I felt. I wasn't asking the other person to tell me what they felt at that point, and I wasn't telling them what they ought to do. Second one, I made a total mess, and I said all sorts of things about what I thought ought to happen. So. And I think the other thing is to just push at the boundaries of whatever that conversation is. Every conversation has its rules. Um, you know, when I, was a, when I was a teenager, my aunt told me there were all kinds of things I shouldn't talk about in polite conversation, you know, sex, death, money, politics, religion, all of those kinds of things. Don't bring them up. Climate change often has joined them. But we'll find that 
in all kinds of conversations, there are ways that you can push at the boundaries without actually breaching them. And you have to experiment until you get that right. The other thing is to listen with empathy. A lot of us, when we talk, we're not listening out of interest in the other person's experience and what they feel, what life is like for them, what their dilemmas and difficulties might be. We're listening for the gap in which we can say what we think will clinch the argument. So we're, 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 we're just listening to kind of, you know, get our two pennies in. This really doesn't help. If you're listening with empathy, you're listening to what it feels like for the other person, maybe to be hearing something about climate change for the first time. And so you're, you're really trying to do something very different. You need to tune in to people's ambivalence and resistance. Most people are actually quite ambivalent about the question of climate change. And you can recognise, perhaps in yourself, that there are times when you feel that absolutely you're on board you want to do something about it and other times i think oh for goodness sake could i just sit down and have a cup of coffee and read a book or get on a flight and go to australia or something of that kind so we're all ambivalent what you hear in conversation very often though is you will hear the resistance begin to enter the conversation so in the conversation i described to you i mean it entered very clearly when that man started to talk about the fact that he thought that climate scientists were hypocrites um, and that's the point at which you need to try to open the conversation much further you need to try to open it up and to try to get some understanding of what, this, what the other person's experience might be that might lead them to feel this way. Often when you do this, you find that the conversation goes into all kinds of different places. And one example I sometimes give is that if I feel that I've actually what's happened is that the other person is feeling a bit um, irritated with me, I will speak it, speak the feeling. I will say, I think I've irritated you, or... I think you're a bit upset with me for bringing this up when you thought we were going out for a nice cup of coffee. Um, or I'll say, or I'll say, I think this is make, makes, maybe it sounds like this is making you feel really powerless. And I will ask, I will check back, is this the case? So I will try to open up a conversation around the feeling. So those are my kind of basic kind of hints to you when you're talking about climate change to try to actually talk and listen and have a conversation in a rather different way. I run a lot of workshops on these themes and I've just sort of introduced you to a few of the ideas that we work on in much more depth in those workshops. And one of the people, some things people sometimes say to me when I get to this point is that they say, well, you just want us all to be psychotherapists, mm. <laughs> you know. That's not me. I want to get out there and I want to speak and I want to say it like it is and I've got things which I need to say and of course this is true and this is where my last point um, comes up there are often occasions where you do have the opportunity to speak and at that point it's important to know how to do it well because a lot of us come out with a load of facts not always the brightest thing to do and so this is um, this concerns the work I was doing with the students at the Lee School yesterday. This is about stories. And stories, if you think about it, make up a huge amount of any conversation that you have. People tell anecdotes um, about, about themselves. Conversations are reciprocal. I tell a story, you tell a story. So stories are really important. This guy here, this is Marshall Gantz. And his project, which he calls The Story of Self, Us and Now, or Public Narrative. Now, Gantz was the man who trained a lot of Barack Obama's volunteers in his 2008 presidential campaign. And he trained them in how to talk to, to the public. And his argument is, is really quite straightforward in a way and it's, his method has been used elsewhere as well it was used by the youth climate coalition in and 350.org in the run-up to the 2009 copenhagen negotiations very effectively so this is what he this is what he thinks um, that stories are how we learn how we make choices they help us access the emotional resources and you'll notice that a lot of what i've been talking about is 
accessing our feelings as we talk about climate change and the feelings of others. Stories speak the language of emotion and the language of the heart, and they teach us not only how we ought to act, but they inspire us with courage, and they help us translate our values into actions. So this is his, this is his pitch for his method, which I think is an extremely effective one if you want to find the story that you can tell about climate change. So... Um, I need my glasses again. <laughs> Sorry. So this is how Gantz looks at the elements of a story. There's a character, and in a public narrative, this is you. Okay? You are the main person in the, in the story. You encounter a challenge. You have to make a choice. What do you do? There's an outcome. Okay? And there's a moral. And if you look back to the story I told you earlier on in my lecture about myself and my son on the walk in Wales, that was a moment of me, the character in the story, being faced with a challenge, a choice, and there was an outcome. And probably all of you can find a story of that kind. So that story which I told you then is part of one of the stories I sometimes tell if I'm wanting to, to tell a story of self, us, and now. And stories are specific and detailed. They evoke the place, the time, the mood, the texture, the taste. They use images, they use metaphors. They try to bring the scene alive in some way. And we saw this in the workshop, which I did with the students from the Lees yesterday, absolutely brilliantly, when um, one of the participants was describing um, growing up I think it was in Delhi, and she says, in Delhi, the smog in the streets, I couldn't see you over there. That's how bad the pollution is in Delhi. And so she, put in, she was putting in details, and I think what we found um, many of the students doing yesterday was finding those details which made their own stories come alive. This, this is, and I think this is a very, very important part of it. And so... What Gantz has is he has these three overlapping circles, the story of self, the story of now, the story of us. And the story of now is about the urgent challenge that you're being called upon to face, in this case, climate change. You need to find somewhere in your story a vision of what we could achieve if you could act and an action that you might call on everybody else to take. You need to think about the us who you're speaking to. Now, tonight, I know that I'm speaking to a group of people who are concerned about climate change because that's why you've come, and many of you actually work in this field. So there is a sense of a community here of, of that kind of concern. But I might be talking to a bunch of people who maybe... Maybe I was talking to the Ramblers Association. I'd be looking there for values that I share with those people. So I might emphasise values of love of, love of the outdoors of the outdoors. I might be talking to a Christian group. I would emphasise my own sense of responsibility for the natural world, which is part of Christian doctrine. I'm sure you can think of other, lots of other examples for yourself of how you can connect with the values of the people you're talking to. If I'm talking to a bunch of people my age, I'll be talking about our experiences of having raised children and possibly having grandchildren and how that impacts. I'm looking all the time in the us for the shared values and the shared experiences. And finally, in the story of self, the questions which Gantz says you should ask yourself is, what are the sources of your own calling? Okay, where does it come from? What are the critical choice points you can recall in your life? And what stories can you tell about these choice points? So I thought I would just fill in a little bit more of my own story of self, us, and now. Very often what you find is you don't get to tell the whole story on one occasion. You bring bits of it out. But once you've got it there, in your background, it becomes what you draw on in every conversation. So the reason that um, that epiphany moment happened to me, that particular challenge, was that it touched values that perhaps I share in my family about justice and equality. And personally for me, some of those come from growing up as the only girl in a family of boys. 
and <laughs> realising that while I was doing the washing up and making the beds, they were riding their bikes and playing football. This gave me a very acute sense of what it was to be equal or unequal. And so these senses of equality and justice were things which came to matter an awful lot to me as I was, as I was, as I was, as I was growing up. And in some senses have infused my politics. The fact that my father had a place at Oxford but couldn't take it up because his family couldn't afford it. They needed him to go out to work. The fact that my grandmother grew up in a family where she didn't always have shoes on her feet or food on the table and that I knew as a child growing up that there were other children in the town I lived in for whom that was still true even in the 1950s. These things have made me who I am and made, given me the values that I have and these are the values that I bring to my work around climate change. So... If I was to tell you what my ask was in this story of self, us and now, my ask of all of you, people who are concerned about climate change, is that you take up some of the insights and ideas that I've communicated to you tonight and work at becoming better communicators about climate change. Because I think this is one of the things which everybody can do. Everybody can talk about this urgent and important subject. So that's pretty much most of what I've got to say. Um, I've got one last slide here, which, oh, that's a summary. Okay, I'll put that back up again in a minute, maybe. Um, this one is just some resources and support. The organisation I'm from, the Climate Psychology Alliance, um, offers some individual and group support to people on, about climate change. It's an organisation primarily of psychotherapists and has a lot of information on the website about climate psychology. A lot of the information in this talk comes from this book um, which I wrote with Andy Brown, um, for the Carbon Conversations project, another project I've been involved with. And you can download that at Carbon Conversations site. And there's an edited collection coming out in April, edited by Paul Hoggett, who's a colleague of mine, who I did this piece of research with, um, called on, on, on Indifference to Disaster, which contains um, a version of the article, which is also in Environmental Values. So if you want to know more, those are some sources of information. Um, that's pretty much what I've got to say. But before we move, or as we move, to the question and answer session, what I'd like to ask you all to do is one last thing. But I also want to just draw attention for one moment to me doing this. If you see me do this, okay, right? I'd like you to put your hand up to show that you've seen me and stop talking, because I'm going to ask you guys to talk now, okay? What I'd like you to do is turn to somebody who's sitting next to you or near you, maybe someone you've come with or doesn't have to be someone you've come with, just whoever's sitting near you, and just share your reactions to what I've said. And while you do that, we're going to get ourselves set up to do the question and answer. OK, so over to you. <laughs> okay. So, so we all. So, uh, where does. I thought you both did brilliantly, actually. It was terrific. Such a different take on usual lectures on climate change. It's interesting not to give statistics. Well, these lectures, funnily enough, they're in the memory of David Mackay. And I was once asked to give a talk um, or a workshop somewhere that he was involved in. And he said, Will there be any grass? And he said, I said, No, no grass. I'm not sure we want you to come. <laughs> I must say, I, I do like, quite like statistics 
to myself. Well, that's but quite... I realise that's not the general population consensus. Yeah. But I think statistics are great in their place because statistics keep us grounded. I, I love that programme more or less. Do you have a glass of water? Thank you all very much. You did that brilliantly. It's a good trick if, like me, you haven't got a very loud voice and no microphone. So where would you like us all to sit yeah. here? Right, if you would sit yeah. here. Okay. Uh, Tommy, over there. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. You probably need a glass of water. I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, Tommy and uh, Sarah are from the Lee School. Uh, Tommy, you were part of the workshop yesterday? Uh, yes, I was. And um, which Roe was leading. And what we're going to do now is we've got, we're going to have some questions. We've got um, questions from the, via Twitter and via Facebook. And um, while those questions, while you're thinking about your questions, um, I'll just get the ball rolling, perhaps, by asking Tommy what you thought of the workshop. <laughs> well, um, I think it was very, very interesting. I mean, a lot of people... So whenever I would uh, to talk about um, global warming or climate change to anybody, I would tend to kind of bombard people with statistics and facts and all sorts of information. And, and now I know why I get such a backlash <laughs> from people. <laughs> yep. Um, so yeah, it's quite interesting to see why people don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> you actually told a lovely story yesterday. You were one of the people who came up and told your story. Would you like to, could you reprise just a little bit of it for us? Is that, is that okay. possible? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Um, so um, my sister is vegan, which, as you all know, will be a very interesting uh, family dynamic. Uh, my mum's pescatarian and my dad's annoyed, so, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so my sister would constantly be on at me saying that I, don't, I need to stop eating so much meat and um, be healthier and stop killing things. And I, I always understood the points that she was making and I kind of, I recognised that uh, what she was saying was important and I should think about it but at the same time, mm, bacon. So <laughs> I, <laughs> anyway, so um, one day um, I had a physics lesson with Mr. Harmsworth, our wonderful physics teacher, and he told me some environmental statistics about um, vegetarianism and vegan diets and things. Because uh, my sister was mainly focusing on ethical reasons, although she did it for weight loss, but whatever. And um, <laughs> no, I'm not saying that, she, no, that's, that's what she, she did it for health reasons. And my, um, yeah, so the same day that I was told by Mr. Harmsworth, I, I, t I decided I'd start eating a vegetarian diet because um, you have such a good influence on me, so. <laughs> anyway, so I, I then kind of was talking to my sister about all the, the facts that she was giving me and all the facts I'd looked up. And she forced me to watch Cowspiracy and other things because um, that's what all big sisters should do. And... Yeah, so I decided that I'd turn vegetarian and further annoy my father. <laughs> I have not convinced him yet to change. <laughs> but. I think the loveliest thing about Tommy's story is he brought humour into it. And this can be actually such a brilliant thing when you're having a conversation about climate change. Get a few laughs and <laughs> it really eases the atmosphere. So, yeah. Well, it's quite, quite, it's quite easy for things to get very tense. I mean, do you have experiences of that, Sarah? Yes, I can tend to get quite emotional when talking about the subjects that I'm passionate about, not just limited to climate change. And I personally love statistics. I'm a scientist, and what well, I want to be anyway, and I love statistics, and 
analytical side of things and I recognise that other people don't and it scares them a bit and they just want to hear a story and calm it down a bit and yeah, it can get quite tense, especially in my family, my sister's an artist and so <laughs> bombarding her with statistics doesn't quite work. <laughs> So now what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, I think, Ro, you'd like to have three questions at a time so we can think about... Uh, yeah, I think if we just the take, the que take the questions in threes, keep them short, and then, and we'll, then we'll, try, we'll try and respond to them. See if we've got the questions from, from outside. So there's a question up the back there. Can we try and also get a mix of men and women mm -hmm. asking yeah. questions? Thank you. So, how do you apply what you were talking about, not to person-to-person -person conversations, but to one-way communication, such as the written word or broadcasts? Okay. There you go, one over there. Do you have uh, any advice if you feel really depressed about the whole situation and you're trying to talk to someone about it, even though you think we're in a downward spiral and it's too late already? What can I tell to a stranger that is in, in, inside his van for 25 minutes with the en engine on and he doesn't stop the engine? I mean, it happens to me quite often that I'm in the street and I see people inside the car or inside the vans for a long, long time with the engine on. Okay. And I really feel <laughs> that I should tell them something, but I don't want to create a conflict that I don't know what to say and how. So maybe you have okay. the answer. Those are three really, <laughs> those are three really, really brilliant, brilliant <coughs> questions. So we've got, what do we do when it's a really kind of a one, a one-man show and you're speaking maybe to a public body or, or in writing. What about the experience of really being incredibly depressed and in a downward spiral? And a really practical one, what do I say to the guy with his engine running? Okay, so, um, shall I have a go at those yes. and then you guys chip in if you've got some thoughts? Um, the first one, if I'd, if I'd had more time, I would have talked about the subjects you raise. Um, <coughs> And I did have an, another slide about it, in which I look at the I look at the role of rhetoric in speeches, and I look particularly at um, some of the speeches of Winston Churchill during the sec during the Second World War and the speeches which he made in the aftermath of the defeat at Dunkirk, because what you see him do in those speeches is actually very interesting. Um, you see him tell the truth, which is one of the things which I spoke about, you see him empathise with the people who have lost loved ones. And there's a, there's a very touching moment in the middle of the speech where he refers to somebody in the House of Commons who is not there because his son has been killed. And so he's, he's, um, he's showing some of these things in the speech, which I'm talking about, he also in, tells lots of stories in the way that he tells it. It's very, the speeches are very vivid. And he's also doing what Marshall Gantz refers to. He has an ask about what he is saying is going to be <coughs> demanded of people. And so I've looked sometimes at those speeches of Winston Churchill, and I've also looked at some of Martin Luther King's speeches and how he um, actually tries to communicate something something difficult and something very demanding. And I think there's probably quite a lot to be learned from those. So I'm sorry I didn't have time to go on to it, but I think what you raised is a very important point. Um, the question about depression. I think actually what you raise is something which um, I think is quite courageous to raise in a public forum, which is the fact that actually for a lot of us, there can be some very, very, very dark moments in, um, in our experience of actually trying to stay on this journey of climate change. And I think 
it's very difficult to talk about something when you're feeling very depressed yourself about it. And I think that the, there's a great need for people within the climate movement to find places that they can talk and to create places where that can happen. One of the things about the activists who we did the research with was that they were part of some very tight-knit groups where they did share a lot of what they felt. And that was one of the things which made a difference to them. One of the other things which made a difference to them was encapsulated for me in a phrase one of them used, which he said, action is the antidote to despair. So it was the doing something and being part of something. Now, as a psychotherapist, that's a phrase which also kind of sells one of, sends one or two alarm bells ringing in my mind because activity can become manic. It can become a kind of defence against facing the grief. But I think that um, it does make a difference to be involved in something that you feel is commensurate with the difficulties that we face and somewhere where you can express the distress and the grief. I do find, Ro, that if I'm sitting around with like-minded people who are all a bit depressed about the whole thing, yeah. that we just we, we, we agree with each other that we're all depressed about it. We just, we get, by the yeah. end of it, we think, so what's the point? Do you and, remember? And if we all do get, to get into that spiral okay. spell together, it's yeah. almost like there's more energy. Do you, do, do you remember, Hugh, um, when I came to meet you and, and Nick Breeze, mm. when we were first, you first asked me whether I might be involved in, the, mm. in this series, and we had what I call an ooh, ain't it awful conversation. And we were going down and down and down. I can't remember the detail, but it was all about this dreadful thing and that dreadful thing and the other dreadful thing. And at some point I said to you both, I said, there's something going on here, we're talking ourselves down. At that point I named, I named the process, I brought us back to the process. And so this, it's the same skill that I've been talking about earlier and I appreciate that it's one that to me it feels like second nature to think, what's going on here? Why are we concentrating on the content in this way and not in another way and to try to open out what we're talking about? Um, but I appreciate that that's not something that's easy for everybody to, everybody to do. One of the things which the Climate Psychology Alliance is trying to do at the moment is to try to um, find people with more of the skills that I have to become involved in different parts of the climate movement to try to offer the kind of support that I think people actually need in dealing with such a difficult issue as this. I also think as regards to this depression thing, if you take a step back and look at your personal journey through discovering climate change and the actions you've taken, if you take a step back and look at that, you can often feel a bit more optimistic. You've come such a long way from when you started and knew barely anything. And if you can do that, others can do that. And as a group and as a nation and as a population, we can all work our way through it and it can start to feel a little bit more optimistic, I find. Good. Great. Shall I try and respond to what you say to the person who's got their engine running? I sometimes do and I sometimes don't. And sometimes I just tap on the window and I say, oh, excuse me. That's brave. I say, excuse me. <laughs> and usually when you tap on somebody's window, they will wind the window down. And I just, I usually say, excuse me, um, I hope you don't mind, but I would really appreciate it if you could turn your engine off. Um, because my brother's got asthma. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I, know how, I know how this affects him and other people like him. Would you mind? And usually they go, <laughs> and they turn the engine off. So I, my brother does have asthma. And <laughs> if your brother doesn't have asthma, um, just, just find someone in this room who does. But so, <laughs> put, up, put, up, put up your hand if, if you've got asthma. There we go, right, okay. But so, does that mean you couldn't say actually what you're thinking, which is, can you please turn off your engine because I think it's the, the climate change is the problem? Well, I might, but at that moment, what I'm wanting to do, my, my ask at that moment, is I want the engine turned off, okay? And um, I, might, I might try that. I might, I might try... Um, 
Do you mind turning your engine off because it's contributing to climate change? But actually, I find the really direct appeal, the personal appeal, my brother's got asthma, gets the engine turned mm. off faster. So I don't always talk about climate change because I think there are, there are other ways in. And if this is a man I'm never going to meet again, what I'm actually wanting to do is to get the engine turned off. Um, and get him to think of a reason why, that might appeal to him, because he's probably got kids or grandkids mm -hmm. or a sister with kids that will actually make him turn the engine off. I'm not going to go that far. So, yes. Okay. So, um, other questions? Should we take some more? Well, take, we've got lots of questions going on here. So, yeah. that's uh, one here, yeah? Um, sure. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on tailoring these strategies to conversations on social media or the internet, just not face-to-face -face interactions, okay. and if that'd be a different way of approaching it. Uh, recently, there's been a movement to, instead of using the words climate change, to talk about climate breakdown. Do you think that's a useful way to address it and whether it it's useful and, sc and scares people to action or it just makes them despair a bit more. Okay. Thank you. Um, some people find themselves in situations through their work or because their children are on the other side of the planet and um, this makes it difficult for them to uh, reduce their, their carbon footprint. How, do you have any sort of advice for either people who are in that position or people who want to talk to people who are in that position? Okay, so these are three really great questions again. <laughs> we've, got this, we've, got, we've got social media, the language we use and how we frame it is breakdown, a good, a good one. And finally, being part of an international family. So, let's, let's start with social media. Um, <clears throat> One of the things about social media is speed. It's very fast. And I think that um, this gives rise to a particular type of interaction, which keeps people, I think, very often in their particular silo. And um, come across a man called... Um, William Davis wrote a book called Nervous States. It's very interesting on the way in which social media has changed um, the way that people, people talk into these very, very fast conversations. One of the things that um, a man called uh, Wilfred Bion, a psychoanalyst called Wilfred Bion, talks about a lot is how, in a way, when we're very frightened, we go into we go into these fast conversations, we hit back, we weaponize everything. And so I think two things. One is try to slow the conversation down in whatever way you can. Try to wait, even if you just wait kind of 10 seconds before you, you, you send your repost. You may have a second thought about what you'd like to say or what it's possible to say or to imagine what the other person is feeling who sent that vile message spinning around the world. So one thing I think is, is just slow down. The other thing is um, something which used to be written on the bottom of the, um, all the communications from an organization called Rise Up who provided internet services to radical organizations. And at the bottom of their, their, all their communications, there was a little message which said, get off the internet, get out on the streets. <laughs> and I would translate that as to get off the internet, talk to somebody face to face. So that's what I'd say about the social media question. Um, climate breakdown, is it a useful phrase or does it frighten people? For how we frame things I think is really important and I think both climate change and global warming turned out to be really kind of poor ways of describing it. Um, and so, yeah, there is a struggle to find a better way. Um, I've been talking quite a lot recently about climate emergency and then I've been pulled up on that because people say, well, emergency, you know, mobilisation, this sort of language, this is the language which brings with it as you prepare for war, um, curtailment of civil liberties. Is that what you mean? So I think language is extremely important. 
Um, and I think I'm, I'm struggling to find the best way to communicate it. I think climate breakdown is one that I, I would use. Um, sometimes you need to tell the truth. You need to try to create the space that's safe enough to tell the truth and to say things which are shocking. So I would think about the context in which you're, in which you're saying it. So that's where I would go with that one. Yeah, I, I had a conversation today with someone who was asking about the Earth's natural cycles of heating up and cooling down, and they were asking, how is this any different? Mm -hmm. And I started to talk in my usual fashion about carbon dioxide emissions, methane emissions, all of those things. And then I realised I just had to take a step back and say to him, you drive a car, car into school every day. Thousands and thousands of years ago, when the other natural cycle occurred, did we have cars? Right. And you... I just have to put it into perspective for him a bit and help him understand right. that the natural cycle isn't quite what's occurring here. So in a way, you were able to use the idea of breakdown. But I suppose what I would always have in mind when I was talking about something like breakdown was the fact was the possibility that that might make somebody feel really quite alarmed or powerless or any one of a number of different feelings, and I might be ready to try to name that feeling. I mean, your, your friend may have been sufficiently defended against those feelings um, that he didn't, he brushed it off. But sometimes even when somebody brushes it off, I can say, well, you know, I feel it's serious. I can see you're brushing it off, but, you know, maybe we can talk about it again later, something like that. Yeah, I think that idea of brushing it off is quite a common culture, with, especially with young people, I've yeah, found. It's yeah. this almost idea of lad culture of it being cool not to care about it. And so trying to break through that barrier of it's important to you and it affects you in ways that you quite don't, don't quite understand yet, I think that's quite important. And the language we use to interpret that to young people who maybe don't have quite an interest that I would or someone else in this room would, that's really important. So that, that, that point where they go, whatever. Yeah. Is <laughs> but isn't there a sense yeah. that... Um, if you've got someone saying, oh, you know, it's just the natural cycles of the sun and the, it's got nothing to do with, with our CO2, I kind of feel like saying, well, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think we ought to err on the side of caution here because mm -hmm. if you're not right, then we, we ought to be taking certain actions. Um, but I don't know whether that's the right... I, right think I, I feel as if yeah. I, want to, I want to agree with, with their side of it and say, well, no, let's... I think what you're trying to do here is to... Is to you're try, what you're trying to get at, I think, is, is what is the feeling that makes somebody push this information away? And I think what, you're, what it sounds like, in a way, where you're going with it is, I wish you were right. I would be so relieved if this wasn't happening. Mm. Um, well, we all would be. We all would be. But that's the point. We would all be really relieved if it wasn't happening. This, this person is expressing that sense that it would be lovely if, it wasn't, if, if, if this wasn't happening. But you can move from saying, you're feeling like that. I would love it if this wasn't happening. Um, it makes me really sad that it is. But see, then there's this the sense thing. that... You know, one thing is, you know, I, I would love it if it wasn't happening because I wouldn't feel so bad about taking these flights to Australia, um, which gets us on to the question yeah. maybe here. Shall we move on to that question then? Um, because I think being part of an, an international family is a very, very painful thing. Um, I'm not sure that I'm ever going to see my aunt again who lives in um, the United States. Um, and I was very fond of her when I was young. But I don't think I'm going to fly out there again. Um, and I think um, opening up the question of what it, what it feels like to, to know that, you're, that, that this, is, this, this is the case, that flying is a, an extremely damaging thing to do. Opening up into the conversation, how you feel about it. Do you feel defensive? Do you feel sad? Do you feel grief? How do you feel in the long term? Where are you going to settle? Which continent would you like to, to be on? And for a lot of people, I think there are... They feel torn. Um, my nephew's partner is Brazilian. 
Are they going to live in this country with his family? Are they going to live in Brazil with hers? What happens to the ones who are left behind? It's still possible to fly now, but it may not be in the future. So I think there's a lot of what um, psychotherapists refer to as anticipatory grief, which we also defend against. That we know that there are things going to happen that are going to make us feel very, very sad that are coming. So I think trying to trying to find the ways of paying attention to how it feels to be part of this group who have, through no fault of your own, ended up separated from the people you care about. Um, it's a serious and painful conversation and one that a lot of us, obviously, we avoid. Or we try to tell each other what we should do about it because I don't think there, are any, there, there aren't any easy answers. You can try to fly less, you can try to go for longer, you can do all of those things, but at some point you just want to be with the people you love. So, And then um, you find yourself not actually bringing up the fact that you are flying in the conversation because you don't want people to know that you're being a hypocrite. And it's quite hard because you end up thinking, well, I work in this climate change area, so I really ought not to be flying. So... The thing is that the more you talk about your dilemma, your ambivalence, your difficulty, your struggle, the more you make it possible for other people to follow you and talk about their dilemma, their ambivalence, their struggle. These are experiences which we share because it's not just about flying, it's about all the other things we do. I mean, flying is one tiny bit of a carbon, of a carbon footprint. And I think it's about, you know, how much we manage to make our lives follow the pattern that we feel is morally correct and how much we don't. And we will all, we will all fail in some ways. Mm. Um, I, so. I had a very similar conversation, yeah. Um, yeah. in fact, at the weekend with my father... He, um, he, uh, my parents and I are going to Australia over the uh, holidays. Don't hate me. And um, <laughs> I'm a child, I don't have any rights. Anyway, um, <laughs> and I, I was saying to him that I feel incredibly guilty about taking this flight. And it was kind of bizarre the way that he reacted. He um, said, well, well, do you want to just stop doing things? Do you want it to kind of control you? And it's just, I wasn't really sure how to respond. I ended up just kind of backing down, just going like, no, 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 and just kind of mm. just leaving the conversation because there wasn't really an angle I could see there where I could, re yeah, end mm. it. I think, I, I think what you've brought up is how difficult these things are when, when they come up in the family because there are so, it, the, the pre-existing relationships which are there, all of the history of your relationship with your father, the fact that you are now coming into adulthood and will be making decisions of your own is usually a shock to a parent. It was there in that story I told about me being a little bit surprised that my son was telling me what was what. And you're moving into that point where you will be telling your parents what's what and that you're going to take decisions for yourself. And this is a painful moment on both, on both sides. On this occasion, you back down. And sometimes I think it's possible to open up the conversation further, but sometimes it's not, because it sounds like it was actually really very upsetting to you that your father closed it down with what, you, you're going to stop doing everything, which was an assumption that he made. His perception of you at that moment was that you were going, you were going off track. You weren't following the path that he'd hoped for from you. You were disappointing him. And so this brings with it all those feelings about... Do you want to disappoint your parents? You know, they spent all this money on your education, they love you, they care about you, they've planned this wonderful trip to Australia. All of this stuff suddenly comes into it and you can be completely flawed for a moment. And I think it's really brilliant that you actually brought this up, Tommy, because I think this is the kind of experience that so many of us have, but actually find it so difficult to really, dis to really discuss and share these, these dilemmas. So we've got a question up the back there, yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask what you think the, uh, 
the role of good news stories should be in Sorry, the, the role, the role of what the role of good news stories good should news be stories. in the conversation about uh, climate change. Oh. I realise that they're kind of uh, minnows compared to the whales, but with things like you know impressive reforestation efforts in India and the fact mm. that Costa Rica ran entirely on renewable um, mm. energy last year, and that Morocco has nearly completed the world's largest solar power plant. Like, should we talk about these things more because they give us hope, or should we not rely on them too much because they make us apathetic? Whoa, right. <laughs> Good one. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to throw in one of the, uh, yeah. the, the, the Twitter questions, which is, uh, will empathy be enough to get others to act on climate change? Okay. Good one. And then we've got a question. Where's the other microphone? There? There was one. Well, there was one just along the road. Yeah, okay. Um, my question is, some, some discussions when it's about personal decisions, um, since everything we do has a certain impact, end up in, you might as well kill yourself. <laughs> um, what's, how do you react to that? Whoa. <laughs> Come into my consulting room. <laughs> um, Okay, let's let's take the good news stories one. I think this is a really this is a this is another this is another really important question, because I think it depends very much on when you are telling that good news story. If you tell that good news story in response to somebody who is being being very negative, um, or who is um, expressing something about how serious and how difficult it is, and you want and you start to say, oh, but um, you know. They've done this in Costa Rica, they've done this bit of reforestation, whatever it is. What you're doing will feel like it's a drop in the ocean and it will feel like it doesn't matter. But if you find a time to talk about your good news stories at a, at a, at a point in a way when the situation is much more neutral, when the feelings are much more neutral, I think they can have a very good effect in actually bringing people up and helping people see that, yes, things have happened and things have changed. I think it's very much about paying attention to the mood when you introduce your, 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 good, your good news story. And I think it can sometimes be very effective um, to have parts of um, you know, a site which are about those stories. Um, 1010 at one point had whole pages of great things that have happened and sometimes it was actually quite nice just to go and look at them if you chose to um, so I don't think they should be out of the way but I don't think they're an answer to um, they're not an antidote they're, they're, a part of the, they're a part of the story so. I think it's often the small successful things that can actually dishearten you sometimes because it's like they're doing this, why can't we? And it feels so hard mm. to scale it up and it can make you feel very small and yeah. make the whole situation feel too big. Mm. Yeah. And so then will, will empathy, empathy, empathy be enough? It, it, will empathy be enough? No, of course it won't be enough. <laughs> <laughs> we need... We, no, no. We need engineers. We need... We need wind turbines, we need solar panels, we need reforestation, we need, we need a gazillion things. We need, and we need to tell stories. Empathy is part of how we talk, how, how we listen. It's about this process of trying to listen in order to be able to engage people and move them on. So no, empathy is not enough. And then if the empathy gets to us and we think, right, it's just too much... <laughs> Right, and um, conversations would end up, well, I might as well kill myself. This, is a, this one, I think, um, becomes, almost sometimes becomes another version of um, sort of head for the hills, survivalism, or, well, we might as well party to extinction. So I'm going to, you know, fly everywhere, do everything. Um, and I think it's this kind of, sense sometimes that people almost enter a state which is masochistic and if I talk more about the stages of this journey and the way that people defend themselves 
One of the things which happens sometimes as you get to know more and more about climate change is you get stuck in that stage which I call immersion. And you're stuck often in two things. You're stuck in um, forever reading the news feeds about how dreadful it all is. And you somehow become a kind of an addict. You, 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 can't, you, you, can't, you can't let them alone. And I think it's necessary to let them alone. Because otherwise you also get stuck in this feeling of the overwhelming feelings of it being too late and not being able to do anything. One of the most interesting things about the activists who we talked to was that they didn't look at the climate change news very much. Whatever their particular job was, if it involved something about climate change, they would, they would keep up to date with that um, as much as was necessary. And one of these guys was a man in his 50s who once a year he had to do a... He, he, did a, he did a workshop or a talk about climate change for an organisation he was involved in. And he described how when that, that point came around, he would get into a state of high anxiety and it would take him a week to recover. But the rest of the time, he concentrated on what he was actually doing. And I think, I think this is a very necessary thing. And one of the other people we interviewed just talked about how sometimes he said, sometimes I get my climate panic on. And these would be his very dark moments when he would get into his climate panic. He would come out of it and live life ordinarily, but with climate change there in the background. One of the ways we described it in the, um, in the uh, paper was it's rather like when you first get a medical diagnosis and you discover you've got diabetes or arthritis or whatever it is, you spend all your time online looking it up and looking up all the research and finding out all about it. And then there comes a point where you, if you're actually going to carry on living your life, you've taken what you needed to know and you put it into the background and you get on with life. And so there's a sense in which these climate activists put climate change into a, into a particular place in their mind. And this was very different from the splitting which I described earlier in that state of disavowal. If they needed to talk about it, they could. They would bring it out from time to time, they would have a look at it, but for the most part, they kept it somewhere manageable. And so, I don't know if that's much help, but um, there we go. So there's a question up the back, yeah. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask about time. Um, it seems like this process of moving from um, ambivalence to action um, isn't always linear and that it takes time but mm. part of the truth is that the, we're out of time mm. and I think for me that's the thing that causes me the greatest anxiety is realizing yeah. that yeah. I can't speed this process up for myself or for the people who I'm close to so I'd be grateful for any advice um, or wisdom that you have around that. And there's a question here. Um, yeah, well, you've talked a bit about activists, and I'm one of those, and I wondered what advice you had for us in terms of choosing slogans, actions that might be effective. I know this is a huge topic. Yeah. And also how we might speak to, say, drivers that we've just blockaded um, yeah. by way of apology and explaining what we're doing. Right. <laughs> and there's a, a related question on Twitter. Um, climate activism can definitely help to start a conversation, and it's often positive. But what do you think about activism that attaches some aggression and intimidation to the issue? Do you think that this changes mm. the conversation and diverts it away okay. from the cause? So the first question, I think, was about, was about, was about time, and time and, I'd say, grief and despair and anxiety and all these unbelievably difficult emotions that you're, that you're experiencing. Um, it may be that we're not going to make it. I think, you know, this is one of the difficult truths that we don't quite, we don't know what the future holds exactly. And um, writers on environment and climate have also always sort of had their own particular sort of determinism, which goes, if we don't do X, then Y will fo we'll, we'll follow. And I think those conversations now become it sort of feels, you know, the why, the, the, the bit that, 
um, you know, feel, feel, can, feel, can feel very close and, and, and very, very, very problematic. And I'm reminded in a way of what Bill McKibben said. Um, and he said, well, you know, if we can't stop one and a half degrees, we'll stop two. And if we can't stop two, we'll stop two and a half. And if we can't stop two and a half, we'll stop three. And I think it's that sense that um, when you're faced with something very desperate that you don't know the outcome of, like my parents were faced with during the Second World War, they didn't know that the Second World War was going to be won by the Allies. And there were many moments when they thought that it wouldn't. So the question is how you keep going in the, face, in the face of something like that. And I think it's through solidarity. I think it's through your connections with other people. I think it's through the, the possibility of talking about what you feel about it. I don't have any wonderful, snappy answers for it. Uh, I think it's, a very, it's very difficult. And I think we are all people who are experiencing huge amounts of distress and pain at the moment around this subject. Activism. Activism. Oh, this is a really interesting one. I actually came on um, the Extinction Rebellion demonstration last Saturday. One of the things that really interested me there was something which has often preoccupied me about um, when you're on a demonstration of that, of that kind, is that there's a sense of everybody who is on it is in the demonstration and facing inwards. And pleased to be with the other people who have come and in some ways finding it quite difficult to face outwards to the people who as you say you may you may be inconveniencing or the people who are just walking past and one of the things I observed was that it was quite difficult because we were supposed to be keeping on the road to get onto the pavement and engage with people and um, I was trying quite hard to move onto the, onto the pavement to talk to people because that was what I thought the point. <laughs> For me, that was the point. Um, sorry, person with the microphone, I keep um, <laughs> banging it. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's moments when I speak from the heart. <laughs> but I suppose what I'm saying is that um, I think... I remember from being on demonstrations in the past, you'd have your leaflet and you'd hand it out to somebody. And... This is actually quite an aggressive act. You're giving somebody something they haven't asked for. And what happens to a lot of those leaflets is they go straight in the bin. So I think what I would want to talk with you about would be how to actually use the actions, um, often which are in very big public places. I mean, this generation of actors is doing something slightly different to the lot who I was interviewing. Um, how to use those to actually create the conversations that you want to have. Because I think that actually there's a huge potential in that for talking, for being able to go up to people and say, do you know what we're doing? Are you concerned about this? Um, can I tell you, do you have time to stop for 30 seconds while I tell you a little bit more? And what you do is you hang on to the leaflet, you don't offer it until actually they're begging you for it. <laughs> 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 then you know that it's going to be read. Um, so I think there's an awful lot that could be that, that could be done there. And that kind of does I'm not sure that answers the other question about the aggression. Mm. I mean, I think one of the things that sometimes happens um, is that because people really do feel pretty angry when they're on a demonstration. You can get that crowd effect of that getting whipped up. And this is one of the things which, if you ever watch Martin Luther King calming a crowd, talking to his followers about exactly how they are not going to retaliate, it's, a, an, it's, a, it's amazing to, to listen to. Because it's that... Um, I think that's so important... Um, to actually believe that all the people walking past are potentially on your side, they are potentially your allies, and to treat them that to treat them that way, I think is one of the most important things. So I think we've come to the end of this uh, um, this evening. Um, I've just got a few things to say. Firstly, is that next week is uh, at the Babbage Lecture Theatre at seven thirty. And it's James Lovelock, 99 years old. Um, he won't be there in person because he's um, uh, just a little bit frail, but he will be, we've recorded his 
answers to various questions and there'll be a conversation with Chris Rapley, Tim Lenton and um, uh, Helen Chersky. Um, now it's, it's notionally sold out on, on Eventbrite but there will certainly be space for people who turn up on the night to come along. Uh, so do, do come along. Um, I want to, this is really the last opportunity, this is the last of the this small group uh, CCLS talks. I want to have taken an opportunity to thank all the committee helpers like Heather and Sophie and Jamie and James and Amelia who's not here, uh, Tony who's not here tonight and Nick who's not here tonight and Kim and Andrew and pretty, that's about right. So thank you. I want to give you a big round of applause. All the best. And a, and a very special round of applause to Jordan and Mike, who have tirelessly done all this. PhD. <laughs> <laughs>